Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to the Coffee Club Podcast, episode 57. Huge guest today. We have Mr. Cheeky Chavez, <laughs> as he's just been named by Oliver Hoare. Uh, Chris Chavez, how you doing? I'm good. This feels like, you know, when uh, you go to like a theme park like uh, Universal Studios or Disney and you walk onto like the set of a movie and it's like I've watched enough of these that I walked right into the set of like one of my favorite TV shows. Doesn't feel real. Is no. it uh is it what you thought it would be? Uh it's actually more organized than I thought it would be. Yeah. <laughs> That's uh, <laughs> that So Chris has come on the show and he's in, just straight away lied because <laughs> absolutely <laughs> because we've been saying it this has been the most disorganized we've ever been just because we had Joe and Sage's wedding last night so it was like a real slow morning for us. I would say like no normally we have practice scheduled time every day of the week 8:30 and then we got the text late last night do whatever you want tomorrow. And so it was like... We turned up at 11. Yeah, it, it, it wasn't great. And then we got all the, we got the OAC, I mean the On Summit, sorry, happening this week. So it's just like a lot of stuff happening. But we're very happy to have Chris here in town. He's doing some filming for On. Um, I don't know if you're allowed to say what you're doing, are you? Uh, yeah, I think it'll come out in due time. But Mac and I are here. We're working on a couple projects. And so... Uh, yeah, stay tuned. I think they'll come out in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, but obviously very excited to get him on the show representing the Citrus Mag, our biggest and fiercest competitor. <laughs> um, we heard that you wanted to buy us. Counter offer, we're going to buy you one day. All right. <laughs> when we get big enough, so just watch out for that. And you have like, to change your name to Citrus Mag. It'll <laughs> have to be changed. Change it. Like it just has to happen. And I think I, I've always thought that we might have to beat you guys to the punch to like coming out with an actual like citrus mag like merch line before you, you guys do it. You have to do and it. And we're just gonna own it and lean right into it and, and hopefully uh, it'll be received well by your guys' fans too. Yeah, that would just be that's just a smart play right there. That's just like <laughs> that's just like okay, not to talk about like this like type of stuff, but isn't it just the best idea ever if Shelby had turned up to like the world champs with a burrito truck called Shelby's Burritos? Should have made a killing. Should have made a like, fortune. Just be like, you just got to own it at some point. You got to lean into it. I, I love how it was immediately you guys are like, all right, we're going to bury the hatchet with Bowerman. Oh, shit. Oh, oh, it's on. And then just one, one episode, episode later. later. That's not even a shot. That's just good business advice. <laughs> we're just, it's just an example. We're using an example that... Is she an entrepreneur or not? Hey, exactly. You yeah. got to make money. She should take advantage of the situation. So... Yeah, that's out there. If you want that, Shelby, we'll take a little cut, but <laughs> I'm sure you make some good money on that. But uh, before we get into, obviously, we're going to do a bit of a deep dive on you and everything you've done in the sport and Citrus Mag. Do you have, we've heard about the dictionary that you have. Do you have that on hand? I do. Yeah, I do have it on hand. <laughs> Can we take a look at that just to I, go through? It's a running notes document that I've got on my phone. And so it's just labeled Coffee Club Blingo. Um, that's pretty, that's, 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 a, long long. that's it's, a long it's list. That's a long list. It's a pretty long list, yeah. Do you want to read you can off add some cheeky So, I mean, like, to it. I feel Chavez. like a lot of these are fairly obvious where, like, if I read them, you can identify who they are, but it could test a little bit of your memory to see if you've, if you remember. So, that's obviously, first entry in this is Keith Hoare equals Ollie Hoare. <laughs> Citrus Mag, that's an easy one. Cooper Teardrop, easy yeah. one. Hole Cocker. Yeah. Uh, Colby Jack. This just sounds like That's me being an idiot. This yeah. is what it sounds like me getting people's names wrong. Ben Thompson. Ben Thompson. One of my personal that was, favorites. That was an actual mistake. That was, that was, an actual that was mistake. a genuine one. That was a genuine mistake. I actually thought his last name was Thompson and then I just rolled with it because I knew that they were laughing at me to the point where I was like, okay, I definitely fucked his name up. What do you do? Then what you've you got do? Ribeye. Oh, yeah, Ribbage. That's a good one. UTI Track Club. <laughs> they, they, I don't know if you, I don't, it may not come as a surprise. They don't appreciate it. They don't it. like UTI. <laughs> they like like United Airlines or uh, what was the other one we had? Emirates? <laughs> no. Yeah, we started calling them like the UAE. Some, yeah. I don't know. Jordy, you had a good one for me. I can't remember what it was though. Sinclair oh. like approached you about yeah. it. She was, she was about she, it. She, 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 she was, was about to throw hands with George hands. about it. <laughs> At the fifth day of the party. She was not happy about it. Then you've got Morgan Beetlejuice. Obvious. Yeah. Textbook George. Yeah. Heavy hitters, Gus Morgan's. is in here. Uh, Jerry Shoemaker. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we can take credit for that one. I don't. I feel like that one's my favorite. Uh, for some reason, I have wrote down Goose Check. It was the Goose. For some reason, you called him that. Goose Check. Sure. That's. I mean, anything yeah. can come out of Ollie's mouth. Yeah. Hack Attack. What is that? that what was is one that? hacker? Oh, hack Attack. Nice. Then there's just Cedric the Celery was entered in here. <laughs> Uh, Tinfoil Elite. Yes, that's a good one. Bowel Movement Track Club. Bowel Movement Track Club, yeah. 
Uh, Jingy. <laughs> Jingy. Getting Jingy, Jingy, Jingy with it. Helen O'Beary's is slang for beers. Helen, it, that's actually like just like the coolest one, I would say. So the Helen O'Beary one, like I literally spoke to, uh, oh, who did I speak to? Was it one of you guys? But I actually want to start a beer in Colorado and have Helen on it and call it Helen O'Beary and then to sell it. Like if you can sell it right, like a marathon. Right after she wins New in York. In New York. Like in New York, you just sell it at like an on station that'd be unreal there's there's enough like breweries out here that's and and like there's breweries across the country that have like running ties and they come out with like the custom like one-off like runners high brewing mm-hmm. or something like that that you could easily find i think someone would make it happen oh, that's a plan uh smith's chips i think is <laughs> something you once called mike smith <laughs> Smith chips. Really? yeah that's really good that, that was I, I, I did, that, wait is that does that exist in yeah. America? Because that's a chips brand in Australia. It's a very, very Smith. popular really? Smith. Yeah. yeah. It's, I, do, it's I like actually Lays. do remember saying that. Yeah. I do remember saying that. Ellie, really Ellie Haynes? It was Ellie Hennis. <laughs> that's <laughs> probably just a genuine mistake. That's a genuine mistake. <laughs> Nathaniel. That's our coach. Yukon. Yeah. Nathaniel. <laughs> Jake Whitecastle, <laughs> and then uh, Mark Wetpants. <laughs> I, I don't remember that one. Who's that? Who was that? Was that, was that me? Think, was that you? I think, Chris, I think most Chris of these come from me. you. Yeah. <laughs> is this mostly me? Yeah. Yeah. Wait, you I, forgot I, about uh, Colin Salami? Remember? Okay. Co- uh, and so, then, there's a lot. There's a lot of other ones that I remember. You're going to have to go back and listen to every single episode. Oh, yeah. I, I, I don't know if that's a job for me. That's a job for Tom Wang. Yeah, Tom Wang can do that. I said some ridiculous shit on this podcast. Shout out to Tom Wang, man. Um, if should we mention Tom Wang and your affiliation with him now? Because Tom Wang is the, the he's like a recurring character now. I guess he on the is, podcast. Really just gets is. mentioned every other episode. Well, because obviously we talked about him a bunch last time uh, as being our super fan who came and saved our party. He's also infiltrated the Citrus Mag Citrus circle Mag. <laughs> in a way. Yeah, so he's, my, he's my training partner. partner. Yeah. yeah. Uh, just a couple weeks ago, I think right after Fifth Ave, I saw that he ran five flat for the mile, and I was like. That's my goal. I want to do that because I've never broken five and, and I want to. And I was like, I don't have any training partners. I knew he reached out to me at one point and said he lived fairly close to me. And we found out we live five blocks away from each other. And he doesn't train with anybody. So we just started jumping in and doing a bunch of workouts together. And I think he's getting ready. We're both going to time trial the 5K this weekend. So no way. I think he wants to break 19 minutes. And I was like, all right, right, let's. I, I think I could do that right now. So uh, we'll probably do that. I haven't raced a single thing this year so i'm just trying to get back into it and so uh yeah tom wang he's, who's, uh, who's coaching this duo i'm just following whatever workouts he does he gets from, <laughs> do from uh i think he's got a college coach or a friend of his is a coach or something like that i've got my own coach but i'm not bothering them with that <laughs> with anything right now so just doing secret training right i'm now. just jumping into wom tang training basically that's yeah. good um i don't know why this made me think of this are you guys excited for Kyle Mer- Merber's marathon debut? I'm curious what you guys think he's going to run. I just, I just don't really care. <laughs> <laughs> Can I say that? Morgan, Morgan, it's, Morgan's fair. Had, it's fair. Morgan's had this strong opinion for a while. Okay. No, it's like, it's, it's not Morgan like, complains every Wednesday. Obviously, yeah. I, I love Kyle, but I'm like, man, I don't follow you to hear about how your marathon <laughs> training is going. Well, I think the most interesting part is that there's a big population, of, not, uh, not a big population, but there is a population of people who care, it seems like. Yeah, yeah. which makes sense. Well, he's not, he's not the audience. <laughs> It might not be that, but also if you think about just how many people are in the elite fields for these marathons, and like if you talk about like the 30th fastest guy in that field or like down the list by PR, no one really cares, but people seem to be more invested in like what Kyle's going to end up running, and I think that just goes to show just how important it is, I guess. You guys get this hammered into your head constantly, which is like you guys got to market yourselves, you got to put yourselves out there, be more active on social media, and like the fact that retired Kyle Merber gets more attention than one of these guys is going to finish top 25, top 30. Goes to show, I guess, like an example of that. And Kyle's getting some good money, I guess, to run this marathon too. He's, he's really? yeah. Well, when you put it like that, I guess I do care. Because <laughs> now I am actually kind of interested in I'm what sure, he's going to yeah. run. I'm sure, yeah. When your days on the track are done and you decide to retire and you've built up this following, you could still sell it to somebody to be like, hey, give me a couple thousand dollars and I'll run this marathon. And you'll probably run pretty well and 
you end up walking away. It's like it's not your primary event or anything like that. Well, so. it's, it's, it's literally like Nick Simmons carrying his wife for 100 meters. Yeah. Literally like that sort of Great stuff. Story and we're not the audience for that. Like, no, we're, we're not. No, care, I'm, but, I'm definitely not the audience for that. But like he is literally still riding on that kind of following he got from um, yeah. his, his career. So like it's kind of like what you're explaining, similar thing. Yeah. Which is like what... Honestly. There's a lot about where the state of our sport is at. That, yeah. That's what's interesting. Oh, 100%, because there are people like that right. in the sport that um, have that big following and able to kind of create much more of a big profile, but the result might not be like something like crazy. Yeah, I mean, crazy. At, at the end of the day, I do like really respect it all. Like, I, like I, I do kind of joke that I don't care, but obviously I do actually He's care. He's backtracking. And <laughs> He's backtracking. I mean, I, I respect a lot. Wait, what do you think he's going to run? Uh, I think he'll run around 220, 221-ish, and then... We'll see. I mean, he wants to maybe try and go faster than that, but like on a much easier course. It's New York, so it's yeah, not, and New York's hard, right? Yeah, he said the ideal situation would have been if he got to run with I guess. like the pro women, but the way that the start is structured, it's it wouldn't work out. That it doesn't way. work like that. No, I, the like my favorite thing in the storyline so far was Kira Tomato's tweet. Uh, that's another one I have to add to the dictionary. Yeah, <laughs> yeah Kira did, you guys, did you guys see what she tweeted? I did, but I've forgotten. She so, wants to beat him. Yeah, yeah. she tweeted yeah. about, about beating him. I think she race. could too. Well, he when she ran at, what was that road race that we were at? Uh, Falmouth. Falmouth road race. She won that race, and Kyle would have finished fourth, I think, on the, in, if he would have been in the women's field. And she he was like, I'm like two or three weeks behind her training. And so uh, he saw what she ran in Berlin, and he thinks he could be right there, I guess. So... It would be close, I think. Yeah. He's going to hate that I said that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it hopefully will like, give motivation to like just push it. Yeah. But so, I mean, could you imagine if he did start with the women? It's like Helen O'Beary with Kyle right behind her. Oh, That's mate. Scary. Helen, Helen's dropping us on her easy run. Really? When we're running like longer, harder stuff. Yeah, she's insane right now. Like some of the training she's been doing with uh, with Ritz is like so scary. Like I don't, I'm ex- excited for obviously to see what she can do in New York, but I don't even know if I could train like that. Now, I was wondering, nuts. like, with you guys before a race, how much of a coach, like, is Ritz, like, to pump you guys up before a race? Like, is there that, that last minute sort of, like, pep talk? Because for him to try and do that with Helen, Helen, I feel like, is just, like, all business. She doesn't even need anything to be said. She doesn't even need Ritz there in New York, really. Right. Like, she wouldn't need him. He's just, she's just that experienced and that much of a veteran. When I was going through my first year, I don't know if George got any of this when he was racing but Ritz was always like oh you gotta like we gotta prove something we gotta pr-, you know I kind of like we're the underdog we're like no one cares about us everyone thinks we're gonna be a flash in the pan like we're not um a big deal I think that Ritz sees and himself as like your puppet master I think he thinks that he knows how to Jimmy play, play your emotions very well see that my emotions come from self-hatred so like that's <laughs> like Ritz, Ritz doesn't need to help with that that literally is already like I can just go like that yeah, switch yeah. it and it's going but he thinks like I I guarantee you he probably looks at a race like in New York, for example, when I ran 332. He probably thought he saw that and he was like, that was all me. That was me telling him, like, we got to prove something. But it was literally me just hating myself and making sure that I could hang on to, to White Castle. So, um, in general, like, it was, yeah, I mean, he does do that with a lot of, but he's, everyone's so different. Like, I'm yeah. sure he doesn't say, he G's me up in that sort of way, but then he thinks that maybe like Mario or uh, Morgan or George. He I think might he definitely, have to do something different. He definitely probably gets you going the most because i think he knows you're an emotional runner <laughs> yeah no so, which yeah, is, i am as I opposed am. to someone else who might well, joe, run like, off run off less emotion like joe and alicia i don't think as are as emotional um runners i think sage is a bit of an emotional runner Sage was sage but she has so much like she's so self-driven yeah so she's like she's so like independent with that stuff i doubt he really does much for her george and i i would say we're probably pretty similar where like like when we raced uh together in Roberto and uh ritz wasn't there it was like, I don't know, we both just had like a short phone call with him. Mm-hmm. And it was like very chill. It wasn't, any, it was just like kind of more like, yeah, this is what we're going to do today. But uh, no, like, yeah, you got to prove that you don't suck. To the no, that was, that, type, was literally, type, yeah. that was literally what it was. It was like, <laughs> you got to prove to everyone here that like you're actually a professional runner. I was like, oh, I thought I was before that comment. But yeah, yeah it was kind of like, I mean, yeah. I think, I think Ritz is valuable in that, that sort of things, but it's like, I find the most valuable talks from Ritz are during workouts. Yeah. Like really, really hard workouts. That's workouts. like, that's like crucial for that kind of chat. Whereas chats before races, like it's just, you know, it's yeah. just not being annoying, I guess. Yeah. And he's not, he's actually really good with it. Cause he knows how to deal with it all. So 
Yeah. And looking at the situation with Helen, like that's just so unique because he's only coached her for what is it? Two months now? Two months, yeah. Or something. And she is such a pro. She is, she is all business, but she is like actually way more f- funny. I feel like a lot of like athletes yeah. are like that, where they're like actually really funny when you get to meet them. But she is so business. She wakes up super early in the morning, gets it done, has writs on the bike. So I feel like they've spent so much time together training that they will they must have like a pretty good bond, good relationship by now. But I doubt he really feels like he has to do much for her at all. Yeah. I think he's pretty relaxed. But yeah, hopefully Mac is there to capture it. <laughs> because the thing is, even if Ritz doesn't tell you, like even if he doesn't try to G you up, he himself will always be extremely G'd up because he's a very emotional coach, mm-hmm. I would say. He's very, he cares a lot and he's very invested. And yeah, it means a lot to him. He takes it personally like he takes the results of his athletes and their performances very personally and it is very impressive seeing yeah how much of like an emotional roller coaster a race is for him yeah good race or bad race yeah <laughs> he'll take it to heart like i i'll never forget like going to um the uh usa 10k champs when joe won we were right next to shalane flanagan and like all the the bauman people and they were supporting and everything like that and i didn't realize this was behind us and all I all I hear is like when Joe crossed the line, we're all cheering up, and then I like look around, and Ritz is like swearing, smacking the pole, and then just sprinting past all Bauman, like Jerry and everyone, just sprinting past him to get to the finish line. Like just absolute like just and like the energy he had is just it's unbelievable. So um, that's that's kind of exciting to see when you have you know teammates produce a result, and your yeah. coach is just so behind it. It's it's a very comforting thing. Yeah, so you guys will get to witness that. I mean, obviously, that's the big thing on the radar for us. Uh, New York Marathon, that is, for Helen, representing the on team and all that. But kind of moving away from that and getting more into Chris, uh, I don't really know where to start. I guess we should probably start for anyone who doesn't know, because obviously, like, none of us know exactly your background. We know you were a journalist, now Sidious Mag. Yeah. Like, how did it all start for you? Were you always into running and then you were a ju- no it was the other way around no so i guess like if people ask me like what did i want to be when in high school like what a growing up i wanted to be well first i wanted to play shortstop for the new york yankees like so many kids who doesn't york, right then i like fell in the first round of like baseball tryouts and my baseball hopes and dreams were crushed and i was like all right well i still want to remain pretty close to the sport so what i was like, I'm going to join the newspaper and like, I'm going to cover sports in that way. And hopefully someday be like the Yankees beat writer or something like that. And in college, that was still the plan, majored in journalism. I went to Marquette out in Milwaukee. So Wisconsin treated me well for four years. Um, And then at some point in my junior year, no, 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 this is my freshman or sophomore year, one of the two. Uh, I stayed in on a Friday night and a friend of mine retweeted a link to like a flow track live stream of Oxy and this is in 2012 May and the only thing I remember I don't remember who won the race I just remember that Dathan had a good race and like it was probably like one of the races that like he was coming back from injury and like it qualified him for the trials or he hit some maybe the Olympic qualifier Whatever the time was or the result was, he was just so amped up after the race. And, and like, Flowtrack was doing this interview with him. They put, like, a headset on him. He was just pouring his emotion on And I was like, who is this guy? And I was like, and he's like, he just ran 13-something. Like, that's pretty fast. Like, he might win the Olympics. Like, that was my thought. I didn't really know too much about running. Like, just before that, I was a sprinter in high school. And I, you know, didn't really take the sport seriously at all. And then at that point in my running career i was just like running 5ks and i ran my first 5k in like 20 minutes so for me to see someone who ran 13 minutes i was like holy crap like this is crazy and but it was really the dathan interview that hooked me because i was like i need to know more about this guy and i want to know more about like all these other stars um because it's like everyone got so used to watching when in that time you watch the olympics the mainstream sort of sports fan would watch it for bolt and that's like 10 seconds on the track or 20 seconds and you just move on to the next thing. And that's it. And I was like, but there's so many more events that I was like, let me teach myself what track is all about. So I went back, watched old videos on YouTube, watched 
you know, read a bunch of stories in Sports Illustrated and basically just like taught myself the sport. Then I like shot Ryan Fenton in a cold DM or email and I was like, hey, there's this meet in New York. Like it's a, it was the Diamond League that was happening at the time. And I'd known that Bolt had run there in years past. So I was like, let me just shoot my shot and see if I could help you guys out, whether, whatever you guys need, interviews, uh, social media updates. And so then I just wanted a free pass to get into the meet. And so he was like, sure, like just, you know, we'll put you down for a credential and come help us out. And I did that, did an interview, did social media updates and they kind of liked what I was doing. And I was like, all right, uh, that was, that was fun. And I guess like, I like track, watched the Olympics and we stayed in touch. Then that fall, I came up to Wisconsin, did the cross country meet there. I basically just kind of came together, wrote all these stats and stuff for them. And then they did the commentary and they knew that I was like kind of passionate about it. And I was just at the same time, like, I didn't know anything about the sport. And the, key part was that if it was baseball I get so starstruck around like doing an interview like to this day I think like the only person I would not be able to interview is Derek Jeter like, I would just get wow. way too nervous yeah. around him um, but with track I was like I don't know anything about this guy unless it was Bolt and so I was kind of still learning the sport and then flow track liked what I was doing so every weekend from then on they're just like hey come out to this meet or that meet and I'm in my dorm room in Milwaukee I'm like I can't go to this meet out at the Florida Relays or the Stanford Invitation. Like, it's not that easy to get to from, like, compared to Madison. Mm -hmm. And then they said, no, we'll fly you out to, like, all these meets. And so that's where kind of it started, where I was, like, going out to all these meets on weekends, doing interviews, writing previews and all that stuff. And I got pretty involved with them early on. And so that was basically my entrance to covering track with with flow track in 2012 and i was with them till 2014 basically yeah damn that's definitely not what i would have expected no yeah like some people would think like i was a big track junkie back growing up or anything like that none of that yeah i can't imagine like because i think for all of us like all the people that we associate with we're all pretty similar in terms of the fact that this sport has been a part of our lives in a pretty big way since we were 10 years old yeah. or whatever so it's it's hard sometimes to like I empathize with people that get into it at such a later time. Yeah. And it's almost like, like, why would you do it? There's so much other cool stuff out there. Yeah. But I think for me, what it was in 2012 was that I saw, all right, if I really want to be a baseball writer, like there's only X amount of jobs in that to do it at the major league level. And I was like, it's so hard. I'm going to have to spend time at a small newspaper in the middle of nowhere, America and work my way up, go to a medium-sized newspaper, then maybe a magazine or something like that, and eventually someday make it. Whereas then I was like starting to fall for track that I was like, no one is covering the sport. And I was like, there's no like big like insider sharing all these stories. And there's so many to be told that I was like, all right, like what if I want to go to the next Olympics in 2016? I was like, maybe this could be my lane to get there and like just start you know, helping tell some of these stories. And I guess that's why I did it, did flow track for those like two years in between London and Rio. Yeah. But that was, that was my goal was get to the 2016 Olympics. Wow. Well, it's pretty amazing to hear you say that. And then obviously look at like what you've been able to create today because it's literally like what you're out there doing. Did you get to Rio? Yeah. Uh, I got to Rio cause I did an internship with ESPN in 2014 and then after that, I took a job with Sports Illustrated right out of college. And I graduated 2015. And that first year, 15 to 16, when I got to SI, I was like, all right, you guys have one senior writer who covers track at the World Championships in USA's, but nothing else year round. So I could do that. Like, I had a different role at SI. Like, I was just writing a lot of breaking news stories and across all these different sports, but I was like, I'll cover track and just like have us just do a lot more stuff year round. And so kind of in that time, I was like proving myself to my bosses like, oh, this guy actually like cares and knows track. So let's send him to the Olympics next summer. And so, so you made a job for yourself. It wasn't. <laughs> yeah, basically in a role. It, like it's I was, I was the do. beat writer for track, uh, <laughs> even though there really wasn't like a track or Olympics editor there at the time. And so, yeah, I mean, like. I was doing it enough that they're just like, it makes sense for this guy to be at the Olympics. And so, yeah, in 16, I was at the opening ceremonies and uh, 
that's the one moment where I think like it hit me and I was like, holy shit, like I did this. And I was like, I, I didn't realize it would be that quick that I was like, uh, maybe Tokyo would probably be like the more realistic option. But um, yeah, no, it was, it was crazy. And so I was out there for the whole two, two, well, I was out there three and a half weeks, but the two weeks of track were just awesome. It was, I worked my ass off, I would say just by like writing every single thing prepping ahead of time like a bunch of pre-written articles and and stats and all that stuff so yeah i was basically like you guys would was getting ready for like the big moment and and it, i think it paid off it was good it's yeah. crazy to think about so you were working for sports illustrator at yeah. that time was that so we kind of like skipped over it so from college you went straight to sports illustrated yeah it's it's like not really that traditional i think like most like coming out of college my two big job options were ESPN or Sports Illustrated and like that's a dream for a lot of people and I think for me it just got I got uh, yeah I guess like there's a combination of hard work and luck where I worked hard but then at the same time like I was lucky that I carved like a specialty for myself at that time and so um, I picked uh, Sports Illustrated just because uh, they had like a rich tradition of like covering the Olympics in the past and I was like I want to be part of that and yeah, it was it was worth it. I mean, it was kind of like historic, I guess, to see like some of the past names who have written for the magazine, and then like all of a sudden, I was part of that, which was cool. Yeah. Yeah. And then, so did you go? Not to like skip over it too much, but did you go from Sports Illustrated then to Sidious? Yeah. So I started Sidious while I was at Sports Illustrated, which was kind of like. I, I don't know if I was violating any sort of part of my contract You're or anything about to like get that. Sued. Like, <laughs> I'm going to blackmail you. I'm going to clip this and blackmail you. <laughs> well, it was because, like, basically, City started off as, like, me and a couple friends of mine blogging about track because after the 2016 Olympics, like, I had a pretty hard time with just, like, okay, that was such a high. Like, that's what I wanted to experience. And then all of a sudden, like, now I have to figure out how I'm going to do that all over again it's four years until the next one. Well, I didn't know at the time it'd be five, but I was like, you know, there's this big, big attention on the Olympics. And then for 2017, 18, like Sports Illustrated's audience really doesn't care about track. But in the flip side of the Olympic cycle, in those first two years, 2013, 14, that's when I was like working really hard to try and make a name for myself and to try and get some of that credibility that I didn't really need to do that anymore, work as hard, but I still cared. Like, I still cared about, you know, the Peyton Jordan Invitational or the Florida Relays or whatever it was, but I wasn't going to bother, like, my editors at Sports Illustrated, like, hey, here's a thousand-word recap on the Milrose games. Like, that, for them, like, they'd be wasting their time because it's not going to do a lot of traffic. It's not going to get the most clicks or whatever it was. So I was like, I want to create a place where I can geek out on track. And so for me, that was starting Sidious and that's where the mag part comes in the name it was like there was supposed to be a magazine at some point and there never has been um, I honestly like haven't yeah. even thought about that it's just like it's just called Sidious mag but I'm like there's no magazine it doesn't even matter like it's just that's just the name part of the name now that's the name <laughs> yeah yeah. Well, I, I initially thought there was a magazine I just didn't get to see it like I just didn't know like where no. to find it no, there's oh. never been one. Maybe one never day we'll be. make a one on one of one uh, so special, edition. special edition. Special yeah. edition City Smack would be to, pretty to cool. To celebrate something. But so at that point, is it essentially like you're like, yeah, I, I love covering track and field, athletics, distance running. How can I how can I get paid or make it a business? I never really thought of it as a business at first because like it was literally just me and friends making funny articles about someone shitting themselves on a run or like just kind of, like it was it was all off the wall stuff. My goal with it was just basically like if you look at the NFL, right, there's places where you get your news or there's you know places where people are breaking down things and for me i was like where's like the more commentary humor side of covering track let's run is there for the news and the articles flow track and runner space they're video people but i was like we need like a place where people can like geek out at the same time be funny and i was like what if this is it like i took a lot of inspiration from like the ringer and some of these other places so I'm taking pages out of like these playbooks that are applied to other sports and then I was like I can do this with running and so that's kind of like how it all got started and really 
it was a passion project up until 2020. Like I never really thought of it as like it was bringing in money for sure, like through sponsorships and with the podcast and all that stuff. But I never thought like I'd go all in on this thing until maybe around 2020, definitely 2021. And then, yeah, last year, less than a year ago is when I was like, I'm going to do this thing full time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's fucking sick. That is, so <laughs> that is pretty sweet. That's very cool. Um, I don't know if, you, yeah. Can I ask you, like, how you guys make money and all that? Probably? Yeah, I mean, like, in general terms. <laughs> I've always like, wanted that. <laughs> like, I won't get into how much we're making. No, you know, but like after, I guess. Yeah, uh, <laughs> but it's a lot of it's through our sponsorships. Like, yeah. we've, we're working with brands at their major events, so, and I think, like, we're not tying ourselves down to like one brand like we're i think also like we're working with new balance on like the new balance nationals and that kind of stuff we're working with on around the new york city marathon and we're really trying to diversify that portfolio of things and so it's through you know kyle's newsletter through the podcast we've got multiple shows now we're doing more stuff on on youtube so we've kind of like got all these different revenue streams going and so in a nutshell, that's the most basic way I think of, of how it's all come together over the last like couple of years. It it does make sense to me, but at the same time, it doesn't make sense to me. Right? You know what I mean? Because you would. It's just it's the weird thing about our sport that it's all driven by sponsorship money, yeah. and they're all brand like brands that are obviously very invested in the sport and make shoes, and they're all competitors. But then yeah, they're all just using the same media outlets to do yeah. their content. It's like. Something about it, I think, has to change eventually. 100%. Because it just doesn't seem like it makes sense. That's what we're trying to like also figure out. Like We were reviewing like a lot of our financial stuff in the last couple of weeks, and we're like, I think the big thing that we kind of want to try and explore is finding like that major type of outside of the running world sponsor who will come in and be like, all right, yeah, sure, like... I mean, it's interesting, like, Toyota cuts a big check to, like, USATF every year. Like, that's one of their presenting sponsors, so it's like where else do you can toyota tap into and in running or like like what what's stopping like tesla from getting involved in track and field or something like that yeah. right i ask myself that question every day <laughs> <laughs> doing all but, you can track doing all sponsorship. we want to look at some non-endemic sponsors to maybe break through and, and kind of show them like hey like there's something interesting here that you guys can tap into and there's a big market for it too like there's these major marathons you see how many people are out there and so there's a lot of people who participate in running. I think our job too, at, at what I kind of see City is, is make it easier to follow. Like yeah. we want it to, it being a track fan is hard. And so that's mm. kind of like our goal in a lot of what we do is like play nice with as many people as possible and also make it easy for fans. Yeah. Yeah. That's obviously a very good goal because, yeah, I mean, we can go so deep in this because I think like the sport itself makes it so hard to follow. So it definitely does need people like yourself to translate it and make it interesting yeah. engaging the yeah. story of like a 20 year old in college just becoming a track fan is must be so uncommon like the number yeah. of 21 year olds that become a track fan that late like it's so hard to do it's like you get more of those people yeah i mean there's there's definitely some of those people out there i think one of the thing biggest things that i've been like working on the last two years is like I, I, this is my 10th year of covering track which is kind of crazy but That's I not sick of it yet. <laughs> I, well, I'm getting sick of the travel. I think a little bit more. Like I don't need to be at every single meet every weekend anymore. Like mm-hmm. how I was when I was 19, and like going off to Europe and doing the Diamond League circuit out there. Like that's fun. Like I would definitely sign up to do that next year. But um, I think the biggest thing that me and Kyle have definitely thought of, but I've been working on actually like hands on is trying to get more of these younger content creators like out there like the ones who are doing things like on youtube or on instagram TikTok, and just kind of really mentoring them but then at the same time like getting them sort of like the professional guidance that like hey you can sort of do you can do this for a career if you you know navigate things the right way so like two years ago i started a program called the magic boost and so that uh we had 16 people in the first class 13 people in the second class like uh there were a variety of different things and so like whether they were photographers graphic designers whatever it was and just kind of over the course of 10 weeks i tapped into some of the other podcasters editors at magazines and like people who i knew because i'm like i don't want to have to go to all these meets anymore and so Mm -hmm. like if i can put that on like and help other people who want to cover the sport 
do a better job of it, then like that fills that gap. Like I look, the reason I started it was because I looked around and I was like, there's no young people covering the sport, and there weren't any people of color. There also were very few women, so I wanted to kind of do that to like really improve that sort of space. So yeah, I mean we're going we're, year three is going to be next year, and so there'll be like there'll be an application for that, and like we're always looking for you know new talent to kind of just keep it going. So yeah. yeah. I think that's definitely what it takes because you need like that new people to come in and just do it in a different way so it becomes more interesting, I guess. Yeah. And I mean, you see it. Like, what do you think about like the new gen guys? Because like, yeah, those uh, Matt and and Ben were part of the first year of the program, and yeah. I think like what they're doing it, like so, like lives in like its own space that is so it's creative and different and something new. Like it, I think the biggest thing is everyone want like the personalities and showcasing them. It's, it's part of our mission of what we want to try and do. That's why, you know, when we had our show at the World Championships, it was in a backyard and it was more laid back. We were in lawn chairs. We didn't have, like, a whole set or anything like that. We wanted really people to feel comfortable and, like, be able to sit down with us and open up. And I think New Gen does a good job of that. I think the Potts brothers, Joshua and Aaron Potts, do a great job with, like, the Two Black Runners podcast. So, I mean, the, the, the young people are out there and they're all doing it in different ways. And I think, like... It's up to one the brands, race organizers, all the people to tap into them because I think like they're really good storytellers, and I think that's the one area that I think like is has been lacking for some time because you no one's gonna want to watch the meet unless like it was me who just stumbled upon it unless you're somewhat invested in it. And what I've got invested in was how's Dathan gonna do at the Olympics or like at the Olympic trials, and now all of a sudden I was hooked because I cared, and I think like if the better the storytelling is, the more you'll capture some of these fans to want to tune in here and there yeah, yeah. it's a very respectable mission it's like because <laughs> it's just so hard because like every time like everything you're saying makes sense but then at the end of the day it's just like the sport itself is just makes it so hard and it's like there's such a big gap there it's so weird how running is i'm gonna just say is probably the highest participation yeah thing and but then pro running is just so niche and it's yeah. just like such a big disconnect there where you feel like there should be something that exists there to much better bridge that gap, which obviously is what you're trying to do. But it's just like, I guess I'll ask you the question. I don't know what you guys probably talk about. We talk about this a bunch, so I imagine you guys do as well. But in an ideal world, what does the sport look like to you? Oh, man. It's a big question. I know, right? I, yeah. Well, it's also like, I've heard you talk enough about like, F1, 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 and that's what everyone's saying, right? Yeah, I mean, it's like... It's not going to get to that point, I think, because, like... No, it's, it just can't. There's too many stars, right? It just can't. It, well, that, that was the idea of the Golden League and the Diamond. Like, they've yeah. tried to create leagues to have all these runners turn up, all these top dogs turn up. But the problem is, if you look at the Diamond League right now, Jake Whiteman, um, Jakob Inger, they're not turning up to every race. Right. F- Formula 1, the drivers turn up to every race unless they're sick. Or yeah. they have an issue, something happens to the car. They always turn up, whereas... You know, people like the scheduling for the Diamond League, for, for example, is shocking because like the way it's scheduled just doesn't work well with some people's kind of trajectory for the season. Like people can't do every Diamond League and can't mm-hmm. compete in every single one. But if there was able to create that kind of environment, then people can see people compete against each other more, create better storylines, better rivalries, um, just more entertaining. But like you're right, you can't make it in like an F1. So. What would yeah. you think would be ideal then? I don't know because it's like a documentary series is not going to save us. Definitely not. Everyone, every, everyone wants <laughs> it not. and it'd be fun, right? For sure. But like it's not going to save the sport. I don't know. Like I've been – there's a lot that needs to be fixed from the top down I think from like the organization, like the governing bodies. It's like what are you trying to accomplish and like what is it that – like are you – a governing body or are you trying to be like a media company or like yeah, I, I think there's weird. there's too many hands in different things that you know some someone like USATF might be trying to do and there's I don't know you could shoulder the burden on some like other like there's plenty of people covering the sport maybe just focus on putting together like the best product so I don't know like there's we had a big conversation with Michael Johnson at the world championships and basically what I would say is just like go listen to that episode or like watch that video and everything that he says like that's what i agree with like if there's one guy who should run the sport it should be uh michael johnson and he, there's it was almost like an hour and a half long so um there, there was, was so many different to do. things yeah so i mean that's that's the one thing recently i was like have, toying this idea where it was like 
what if like there's just an offshoot track league right that just did its own thing didn't operate under like world athletics or you know the like usatf it was just like Mm. its own thing that you have your stable of like 20 runners right and you get paid to be part of it so for example like you would be assigned to like a team or something like that and I don't know. I get this idea went so extreme. I was like, "There's no drug testing at this independent thing. There's mm. lots of prize money. There's gambling on it. Like it's everything that everyone's just kind of sell out the there. soul. But also, yeah, but you'd sell your soul, and it's like just its own independent thing. Like it's part of track. it, it's basically yeah. live track trying to do. But like, there's a lot more money in it. Well, that, that was the thing is money, right? Because like, if you look at Morgan has mentioned this a few times in the podcast, the Olympics, even though it's like yeah. the pinnacle of what we do. Um, it definitely lets down our sport in yeah. particular because I get annoyed going to the Olympics and then seeing golfers and tennis players, like like other athletes that are like had their own league. Yeah, that something that we could have. That golfer wasn't millions. focusing on the Olympics yeah. up until maybe six months before. Yeah, they're yeah. like they're getting paid millions and millions of dollars to do an amazing thing in their sport. Whereas for us, like Olympics is the amazing thing, and we just don't get what we should get out of it. Right. In certain con, like people do get a lot out of the Olympics. Don't get me wrong, but. I think, yeah, I think it suffocates track and field in particular, um, just because of how, like, the heritage of track and field in the Olympics is, like, so, like, core. Yeah. Like, when people talk about the Olympics, they, everyone watches track and field, everyone has, there's swimming and there's, but track and field's always, like, kind of seen a bit of more focus, and I think, like, having that um, is a bit of a blessing and a curse. Yeah. Because it's obviously an absolute privilege to compete at the Olympic Games, but it's a curse because... That's our pinnacle for our yeah. sport, and there's no league. Well, there's no... only once every four years. You yeah. want it once every weekend. But there's also a lot of like, there's not, you don't get anything like, if you go and do Formula One, um, say, say Formula One is somehow in the Olympics, right? They win a gold medal, that's great. But then like, they'll go and do like, you know, they'll go and compete in the, in the Formula One season and make millions and millions of yeah, dollars, yeah. and they like go around the world and like meet, like, they have all that as well every year. Yeah. Whereas for the Olympics, it's every four years, and it's just like, it's amazing, but it doesn't. Yeah, you don't get. I don't. You just, you it's not sustain, It's just not sustainable. Yeah. And well, what do you think about this? I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna give you a whole idea. Like I, we have, idea. we have like a massive idea. Which I mean, like if anyone's listening that is like a billionaire, like if you come to us, like we'll 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 like a hundred x your money, like uh, <laughs> like guaranteed. But I think what you said with it has to be like outside. It has to be an outside. It's a, only independent. It has to be independent because there's. Like what exists now is just too like it's it's done. antiquated. It's too, that's a great word for it. <laughs> <laughs> but what do you? I don't know. Is it? I don't know if this is controversial to say. What do you think about the idea of distance running becoming its own sport? I mean, it could work. I, I was I was thinking about that. Like, if this offshoot league, kind of what got me thinking was, like, I I don't consume every single thing that Barstool does, but like they'd have that. They have the rights to that rough and rowdy, which is like the amateur boxing thing, where it's just like two you know local people from west virginia are just going to beat the crap out of each other and then they sell that on pay-per-view yeah and it's like a full-on production that is treated just like an actual boxing match except like it's these amateurs and i think what they did was like maybe in the lead up to it they build up the storyline around those two people about to face off and and i was like these aren't even like the top stars in boxing these are nobodies they're normal people so it's like even to put together this offshoot track league where you bet on, you know, the mile, for example, you don't even need the top college kids. You could take like the guy, the top guys of the regionals, all of a sudden become pros in this fictional league. A sub four mile is just as captivating to the average person as like, like I, they don't know the difference between a three fifty and a and probably a more captivating if probably. they're right on the barrier. And, and then yeah. and then in addition to that, you it doesn't set, look any different. Set <laughs> over under, like you like you can play around with it so much you don't even need the top stars to to be part of this offshoot idea. But I, I think it could work. Okay, so where does the idea go from there? Oh, so you do want the idea? <laughs> <laughs> should we should we give it? Thanks. So. Investors, possibly people watching. All right. <laughs> so this is the quick version of it because like there is like a long version as well but this is the quick version it is based a lot on f1 and cycling but essentially it and is now live golf yeah <laughs> yeah it's essentially a league which has i don't know let's say 10 20 teams and each team has say four or five people that are competing and they have like reserves and all that and obviously there would be 
I mean, yeah, it takes a lot of money, but in the league, like there would be a lot more transparency. People would have like minimum contracts and all that. There'd be like a lot of support in the teams. Teams would have sponsors like a cycling team where it's uh, much more hopefully corporate sponsors and not like just based around like companies. And then the way it would work is there would be a circuit, which is let's say 15 to 20 races in the year. And to be world champion, it's whoever has the most points at the end of the year. So you have to race all of them. And I think you could even be like in terms of, and this is purely just looking at making the best product Yeah. in terms of entertainment, which I think is what you have to do. And I mean, you, if you, is your league, you can be a bit more controlling, like say like take the UFC, for example, like they're pretty controlling over what their athletes do, which is definitely negative sometimes, but also you understand it. And that would be referring to like having to do, having certain obligations for media. Yeah. Because they know like that's what's going to help us sell it. So all that stuff would kind of exist. And yeah, it's like say 15 to 20 races where you go to different cool locations and you do the races. And the cool thing about, I think, is that the races could potentially already all exist because it would be based around, around events which are already historic and you would be hopefully just building them up more. So say you go the edinburgh yeah pen relays edinburgh like all these ones i don't think it would be track races though really i think it would mostly be like road races and it'd be a mix you just you use the existing infrastructure yeah Yeah. you yeah you buy out the fifth day of mile to become part of the circuit yeah you You could also do track too but you wouldn't do track all like you just mix it up just like a few just a few track races and essentially it's all just about head-to-head competition like like no one cares about what time you're running at, let's say, the Manchester yeah. road race, for example. It's 4.8 miles. Like, no one cares about that. It's just a cool race. So every race is kind of like that head-to-head competition. And then within this structure, you're obviously going to have the same people, like, facing off every week. And every single team is going to have an interesting storyline. Like, a cycling team has an interesting storyline or F1 team has an interesting storyline. And it's able to all be covered really well. Each team, obviously, is going to have its own media. Each pretty much, okay, this is another part of it. Sorry if I'm going too many places. No, it's interesting. Like one, it. thing, one thing that really sucks with running right now in terms of creating a good product is the fact that a professional running team is not its own entity. It's part of a brand. It's part of like a brand's marketing budget. So they can only do so much. Think about it from the perspective where a team is its own entity. Then that team has incentive to be as marketable as possible and become the be- biggest, best brand that yeah. they can because that's how they make the most money. Right now, there's not really that same incentive. Obviously, there is a little bit because if a team like the OAC is bigger, that's going to yeah. sell more pairs of shoes for on. But it's not as direct of a link if the team is literally its own entity mm-hmm. and they're trying to survive and make as much money as possible. So if you have it set up like that, then the teams are going to put so much more resources into like covering what they're doing really cool. And you see this in other sports where that does exist. Every single, like all these F1 teams or cycling teams, they all have like the best coverage ever of all their athletes yeah. and like what's going on. Like the storylines are so cool. So I think if you had that component, like that would help a lot because it's just like pretty much a lot of it's about like getting the incentives right to create the best product possible because right now the product just isn't there and it's really hard for it to change. And so if you have this head to head competition where people have to compete against each other, and there's like the storylines of the individual world champion at the end of the year and then also the team. I think like that's just what's going to be interesting. And I think the big thing is also the fact that times don't matter. Competition is what matters. Yeah. What, what I think is really important too is that it doesn't rule out the Olympics. It, no. like, it lives in the same environment. It's just like like the closest. It's, it's never going to be F1. I think we can all admit that. Yeah. But the closest thing in the world right now to it is probably Super League yeah. Triathlon, which is also just a similar sport. But it's like a league within the rest of the races through year. Like they're still doing com games, they're still doing mm-hmm. like the Olympics, but they have a, a Super League in the middle of the season where they go compete for a corporate team, make a ton of money, do these cool races all around the world. You mm-hmm. just do 10 times the points for the Olympics. And yeah. If the team doesn't have enough guys who qualify, then that's their problem. <laughs> <laughs> no, like you, I think it would integrate really well with like, I mean, yeah, the Olympics is one yeah, race every four years. It doesn't really play into the factor. The only thing that really factors into this idea is what athletics. Well, yeah, that's why, that's the big thing is this would essentially probably take down like the Diamond League. 
Diamond League and World <laughs> Athletics. No, I mean Diamond League and World <laughs> Athletics would go. Because if you, particularly as well, taking distance away from that track, all those yeah. athletes going away, you have field events, yeah. throwers, jumpers, multis. They will lose a lot of what distance running brings to track and field meets. Yeah. They will lose that. And like that sport in itself will start to struggle. So like we had a chat with, with Tom Walsh about it. Like street meets, for example, for shot put or for um for Polo. Like those are amazing meets that actually gain a lot of like following and people get excited. And they, you can, they can like or maybe be pushed to create their own kind of league doing something cool like that. Like, so it could, that separation actually would not, would harm them in the yeah. traditional setting. But in a setting of yeah. like going into something else and creating it much more exciting or oh yeah, the throws there's it, so much it, potential. Yeah, you could push that into that because if distance league does that, then they're like, well, with the throws we can do this, so with the pole ball we can do this. Like, so it could create like an even better environment for those yeah. events. It would just destroy and just be traditional. You meet, you meet back yeah. up for the Olympics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you meet back up for the like, Olympics. So the traditional <laughs> yeah. track and field would be the, Olympics. the the history of track and field like. You know, we got to predict that. You guys are just mm. burning a history yeah. book. <laughs> a history book right now, but like the tradition <laughs> but of, outside of the field, Olympics. Yeah. Which would be there's, cool. There's way too much potential. Because if you not. do go to the tradition of, of the Olympics, like back to track and field, the tradition at the Olympics, you're always going to have a sold out stadium. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's, it's always going to be very, very um It probably is actually going to add to it because then all these athletes will just hopefully be way higher profile. Yeah, yeah no. I think like that's the big things too. Like there's this big push for... You know, LA 2028 and track being popular there, but it's like track is not going to have any problems selling out at the LA Olympics because it's an Olympics and it's track yeah. and it's it's always going to sell out. It's the years it's in between reliable. that we really need to work on. Exactly. Yeah. The yeah. the other thing which um, I think would be very cool as a part of the idea of this league is trying to make it such that it's less predictable. So like you're racing on very different courses and different distances so that different people win the races mm. because I think that's pretty boring when the same person wins every time. And to think see how that happens in other sports like it blows my mind that I, I mean I keep talking about cycling F1. No, cycling's a good example like, for so this. This year of the Tour de France the guy who designed the course said he designed it so that Tade wouldn't win. Like he <laughs> he like designed it to make it really hard for Tade to win, which like Imagine that. Obviously, it can't happen in our sport currently. But can you imagine if, like, the guy who's running the sport is like, "Yeah, I'm gonna make it so that Jakob can't win this race." Like, <laughs> that just makes no sense. Or like, literally, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, it doesn't work. Or like F1, they literally on the drive to survive. They had, I, I don't know if it was, I don't know what his position was, but he was saying like he's changing the rules so that Mercedes like isn't gonna win. Like he's literally saying that. Like it's not and yeah. people get it because they're like, yeah, it makes sense because it's gonna make our sport more interesting and Absolutely. make it more profitable for everyone. Yeah. Because and you'll actually end up with like a a world champion or a league champion runner or distance runner as opposed to one single event. It'll be like yeah. over, you know, anywhere from a mile or even less mm -hmm. to I don't know. Throw Tim K in there or something. What yeah. are we call in this league? Chicken Boy Morgue League? <laughs> <laughs> nah, um, yeah, we'll talk about Coffee it. Coffee Club presents. Uh, we're going to have to put our patent, patent down now so yeah. someone doesn't steal it. Yeah, now it's out there. Yeah. yeah. I mean, honestly, if it just happened, I think it'd be really cool because I, I just honestly think that this is what would make the sport really interesting for a, like the general public because... The thing is, like, we're sitting here twiddling our thumbs, talking about the same shit, like, every day, like, oh, this, this sucks. But you see other sports out there that were not popular, that are becoming popular, and you're like, it can be done. F1 just did it. Darts is, I think, yeah. yeah. I wouldn't yeah, have said darts things. personally, <laughs> but that's a good example. Maybe. No, but you're right. I see it all the time. Yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> but, like, I mean, yeah, UFC, another good example. Like, that sport didn't exist that long ago, and now it's, like, so big. So, like, it's, like, it can be done. Like it's not like it can't. It's not like it's impossible. It can't. Things will change. Yeah, and but, and and that's the thing that I don't think we'd get like upset about is like it. It will take years. Like it might. We no, might. Yeah, even, yeah. We won't might not see this in our career if we're lucky. Hopefully, we're the founders. Hopefully, of we're the founders of it. <laughs> but in general, like we we're saying this as a as a idea that we're not going to be in it. We just want to see if we can go and look and see that the sports improved. Yeah. From when, from when it was with with us, like it just it would make us happier because I feel like. It's a sport that means so much yeah. to us, and it's our the, lives. The potential, the there. potential is there. The ridiculous then, thing is, it's not like we're trying to start a new sport. It's not like people don't know this sport. It's like the oldest freaking sport in the world. Why is it freaking struggling so much? Like yeah. the the 
tradition of track and field is just hamstringing us. Oh, mate, it's fucked. Like, it's absolutely fucked. <laughs> like, it's just so annoying because, like, my mates back home, like, I remember, like, talking to them about coming over here and running professionally, and they're, like, they're, like thinking that it's, like, cycling. Like, they think it's, like, it's kind of that setup. I was, like, no, it's not. Like, there's, like, <laughs> like I'm, I'm a very privileged individual that I have a great team and a great support system around me, but there's, like, most of the professional runners do not have like they're literally just scraping the barrel for anything they can yeah. get to, to, to make those jumps. And it's just like, it just annoys me. Cause like, I know these people like deserve a better, better inter- interaction with the sport that we love. So, yeah. So that's our idea. <laughs> I'm an investor. I'm <laughs> no, I feel very strongly about it. I think we all do, but I mean, they, you know, I don't know if you saw it. Swimming have been trying to do similar stuff. Mm. And I think, I, I'm not just trying to like stereotype. I think it was literally like some Russian millionaire. Oligarchy, yeah. Was like supporting it. And yeah. they, they were literally like fighting against, is it Finna? Finna? Finna. The, Finna has the world championship short course and long course. They're similar to world athletics yeah. because they have like a lot of control. But it's funny because a lot of Australian swimmers, because we had Commonwealth Games, they didn't do worlds because they knew Commonwealth Games for them potentially, like particularly as an Australian, they make more money off Com Games. Okay. Just purely from sponsorship deals, time bonuses, winning medals. Like they get way bigger bonuses than world champs, so that would be like me saying going into a world champs at Eugene. Yeah, I'm not going to do it because I won't make any money from world champs. So I'll make money at comps. That's the swimming kind of thing wow. for Australians. Well, so, yeah, but I Fina, mean, there was an actual league. I'm talking about the professional league that was created yeah, so, in swimming. So Finna, Finna, like tried to fight this league because they were breaching some sort of. Yeah, I don't. I can't remember what the exact thing was, but they were building this. You're right. They're building this league, and all these swimmers were getting attracted to it because they were getting signed by corporate. Yeah, like big money. It's big money, like and swimming doesn't have like the the there's like very it's very similar to track where there's like there's not that much money in swimming, yeah. um, and they're all going to this, but like Fina like fought it and won. I think they won. I I don't know what it looks like right now. Probably should do some research, but I do know like the first time they. That's why I said I think. That's why I said I think. <laughs> I, <just laughs> saying, I know they you won. Can say I, I can't won. fact check this one. Yeah. <laughs> I think I think they won because if they didn't win, I'm pretty sure I would have seen it. Well, the league, no, no, the league, no, the league does exist still exists i don't know if it still exists but i know it had like two years at least and i think it had more than that but they had to hold it i think in like the off season or something that yeah. was like that was like what like i don't know Finna it was definitely it was something them. to do like they were fighting with them with Finna about it mm-hmm. and uh that would be like morgan setting up chicken boy morgue league <laughs> like the league we just talked about and yeah. then what athletics like i said co's just coming out morgan is like we're gonna sue you and well that's probably like, the thing that would probably that's probably what they would say they say like if you compete in this league you can't compete in the world champs mm. or something yeah. like that yeah no, that's what the pga is doing with like uh, no yeah, one even knew at home that I was in the world champs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it doesn't really matter. It doesn't even matter. Yeah. I mean, it's not the, a big loss. At the end of the day, if it's a better product, if it's a better sport, then it's going to prevail. Then it's, so. it's just going to do better than the other product. Yeah. yeah but um, when's Seb coming on Cough Club? Oh, mate. Oof. I With his lawyer. <laughs> Probably with his lawyer, yeah. I mean, last yeah, time last worse. time I saw Seb was uh, at Commonwealth Games, I think. No, at Zurich. He was at Zurich Diamond League. Oh, I didn't, didn't say hello to him. I haven't spoken to him much after White Castle, uh, defeating White Castle at, uh, at Birmingham. But, um, yeah, I, it, it's interesting because it feels like I think he, um, like as a president, I, it'd be interesting how much he actually can change. Right. At that position. You're, you're literally the pinnacle of, not the pinnacle, but you're like at the top of uh, this governing body of, of a sport that you love and you've had a lot of success with. I actually would like to know if he can actually do anything. You know what I mean? Like change yeah. anything. Because the only thing that's happened is this stupid freaking rule about the, the elimination stuff. Yeah. Like that's like that came out. And I'm like, literally like all these people. Like, there's like no way you guys, wanted that. No, but there's always you guys like, like, talking about all these things that we can do. Like the drive survives, like all that sort of stuff. And then all of a sudden that comes out. And I'm like, that's just made the sport like a thousand times worse. Which is it's like backwards. you get excited yeah. and then you're like, And then you're hoping you just like, steps yeah. forward, one step back. Oh, you oh, brainstorming. All right, what we've got. Mixed four by four relay. Yeah. <laughs> Give me out. Okay, this Give is the thing, uh, Chris. Like, this is what's gonna though, because if they make that sport as bad as possible, then that'll just make it easier for. <laughs> for I like, okay, we, we've talked about this before. Oh. We're gonna drift into another avenue about DMR. A DMR yeah. at the Olympics or World Champs, like it'd be amazing. It'd be no, so we'll, we'll put that in the league for sure. Yeah, that'd be in the, the league, league DMR because you can I have mean, five, four, 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 five. Me- four members on the team. Yeah. DMR, this is just like a special week where you get like yeah, just team scoring. Like they do a team time trial in a yeah. race. No, yeah. it's just yeah, it's it's Problem frustrating. Solved. But I just it'd be interesting to I really want to sit down with um, Lord Co and talk to him about it and see like actually how much can do because I don't think he does have much. I think there's like just there's too many um, factors. There's too many people yeah. and like it's just it's also I feel like very. 
I hate to sound like a dick, very old people in those positions where I feel like a lot of young people in the sport leave the sport, don't mm-hmm. come back. And then the certain people that are older just stay in the sport until they um, pass on. But I don't know. I just, yeah. I want more young people, like, like particularly with journalists and like stuff you talked about. Because I noticed that Worlds, going back to what you said about like hiring. Yeah, how different was that mix zone compared to anything else? Very, very different. I, I, I actually, I really loved, because you talked about having like female um, people of color in there and I noticed and it was it was recorded that the people of color that were competing were talking to the people of color journalists because they, they didn't want it they wanted to uh, they had that connect it was just really nice yeah, because yeah, they felt like they could yeah. actually op- like getting that raw energy out of people during that very high intense time of world champs it's just you can't get that again so yeah. Um, being able to, to diversify the media um, media zone like it's just amazing that's yeah. like that and particularly like women like women getting asked questions from women journalists like it's an impact that I would never know as a white male um, I would never know this but seeing it and seeing the interaction with it it's really nice no it's a totally different interview yeah and 100%. I think it, yeah, yeah exactly and seeing that like that's a positive step and I really like that and I know like I love what you guys did with that at World Champs it was really really um lovely to see so it's like stuff like that i'm hoping that will keep young people involved like you said and then you know hopefully it just starts to seep through and then morgan's league will come through and it'll be fine yeah. i thought we had a good interview at the mix zone yeah. uh, it was i know it was in between was that one was that one we kind of we kind of called we, we we were speaking as if the final was tomorrow yeah. and so we got ahead of ourselves there but i just remember walking away from that interview i was like i think most people who would watch this interview are not going to understand what we were saying because it was like there was just like question answer with coffee club lingo just thrown in back yeah. and forth and i was like unless you actually listen to the podcast you're not going to understand and, or uh, why i asked the question in a certain and yuck yuck came through yes, the interview right. yeah, and yeah. uh <laughs> and and fist bump me we had a chat because like we don't we, we we joke about jingy all the time on the pod um he's always a fan favorite of mine but we we think that maybe his brother listens because we've seen some comments yeah. from his brother on mm-hmm. social media that makes me believe that he actually listens to the pod but in general like those type of interviews like it's just a fan engagement kind of thing it's just it's it's cool to see like we were at a we were at a wedding the, the joint stage wedding yesterday and we had a i think one of joe's cousins or something was a massive fan of the podcast and he didn't want to ask for a photo at the wedding he thought it was like like a, like a cardinal sin and he was talking to me about it when i was at the bar i said mate i'll go we'll go get geordie and morgan we'll get a photo on the dance floor and we did it That's was great awesome. you know like it was just nice stuff like that i think it's just been able to have that kind of engagement with uh with fan- like yeah it's just what you guys did in the media zone was amazing no it was fun so really, it was a good time really loved that hopefully you keep seeing it um yeah i don't know how we're gonna get a backyard set up in budapest but the yeah hope is- it's gonna be hard to recreate that <laughs> now that i think about no, it. no this one was easy because it was in our backyard mm. and we'd been at pre and we'd been at usa so like we kind of knew what to expect i mean you pretty much lived in eugene for a while too many trips like, i don't, <laughs> don't want to go back until well it's Maybe USA's or Pre. I don't know where USA is going to be next year. I'm well, Donald League Final is USA is not at not at Hayward. No, I don't know where it's going to be. I I would assume it's at Hayward. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. At least you can always do that for USA's, and USA is always like. Cool. Yeah, we have a storage unit in in Eugene. Oh, really? Yeah. Because <laughs> it's like we have like a tent and all this stuff. And we're like, we're not. It's not going to be easy to haul around. But yeah. 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 Well. That was a lot of fun discussion about stuff that we all feel passionate about. Yeah, I think so that we was fixed cool. the sport. Yeah. <laughs> I think I think now just we like know that. what the path is. Now we just got to go down it with and which we just need some CEOs money. To, yeah, throw some money at us. Oh, the one thing I was gonna say was like because you brought up uh, who was it uh, Jakob? Yeah, was that it was something because I am a recurring listener. Another thing for Tom Wang to take on his plate as uh, we need to start keeping track of coffee club stats where it's like number of consecutive episodes Mike Smith has been mentioned or number of consecutive episodes Jakob has been mentioned because there's these little trends and I'd love to know like they do it on like you know it's like a sports stat it's like Six consecutive consecutive episodes. Jakob's been mentioned. So we so we didn't mention uh, Michael Smith until now. So like there you go. He's another. He well, must be. He must have a pretty good streak. Yeah, I, I think I messaged him. I me- I message him. I didn't you message do. Him. <laughs> I <laughs> mention him every week. I wish I could message him. Jordy won't give me his phone number. <laughs> For someone who's like actually, if you think about it, relatively like like our circles are not actually that similar. Obviously, we have George from NAU. It's not like we actually have. Much I've never to do met him. Oh, I have met him. I've met him briefly. Like when we paced um, Abdi through for like an amazing race, he like fist bumped and like cuddled George, and then just like looked at me and walked away. And I was like, I just paced your boy for like <laughs> three. Cuddled a weird word okay. to throw in there. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, that was what I was gonna say. It was like typically when I like go on some of these podcasts, I think people ask like you know the same questions like who's the guest you've had on your podcast you've never had before, and I was like trying to think on it expecting maybe you guys were going to ask. I was like, oh, because this summer totally changed. We had Michael Johnson, we had Shelly Ann Fraser-Price. Yeah. So this time around, I was like, who haven't we had yet? And at this point, like, Shelly Ann to show up in our backyard, like, no one is too, no one's crazy. big, they're, like, bigger than her, I guess, that we can, but then I was like, we've had Seb Co on twice, and we've had Mike Smith on zero times. Yeah. Mike Smith is probably, probably awesome. and, what, near yeah, the top of that Jakob list. as well. Have you had Jakob on? No, we haven't had Jakob on. I've requested him and like, you know, just through agents and all that stuff, nothing yet. But yeah. I think we can make it happen. He's a, he's a hard man to he, pin down. He's a big Let's Run uh, podcast fan. Yeah. Yeah, Which is to, very interesting because that wouldn't be what I would first pick <laughs> as a fan, as him being a fan of. I thought you'd be a fan of, of uh, City Smack, to be fair. Um but uh, no, we've been trying to get him on as well. We've been trying to get on just random people. I think we were talking about one of our dream guests was um, um, who was it? I don't know. I can't. I know. I know. I just looked at you like you would know. <laughs> I can't Stucky? remember. Bobby Stucky? <laughs> was it Bobby Stucky? No, it was. It was somebody that was massive, like big, like big profile, but not really in the running world. I can't remember who Roger it was. Roger Federer. I mean, yeah, Roger would be amazing. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but in general, like, yeah, like, there's those guests that you just think, like, oh, this is the next guest. Like, like it's just, the sport is ever growing, so it's just nice to be able to, like, yeah, always look at the next person you could have. I mean, to be honest, like, Usain Bolt, surely you must be on the, on the podcast. Like, you we had like him. him. Yeah. You've had him? <laughs> yeah. Oh, damn. Okay. Yeah. Try, try again, sweetie. Try again, sweetie. <laughs> Not Mike Smith, though, so I think we got to have a challenge. Who can get, Who Mike, can Smith get Mike Smith on first? first? All right, yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll That's a dangerous that challenge for us, yeah, yeah. though, because you guys can obviously probably get him on. You like, can probably get him on way better than us. <laughs> so that'll be tough, but um, we'll throw the gauntlet down and we'll have a race for it. All right, perfect. The, the race in. for Mike whoever, Smith. Whoever, whoever wins the race gets uh, the rights to the to the Morgan's League. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually a good idea. Uh, I think we'll probably come to a close soon, but I did want to ask you, and this is a very cliched question, but what... What, but I still feel like I have to ask it. Citrus Mag, Citrus Mag. What's like, what's like the vision? Yeah, I don't know because uh, Kyle and I have been talking about this, and Max been in on some of these talks. We have a lot of big ideas for sure, but like I think for us, what we're gonna lean into over the next couple of years for sure is like really the athlete storytelling, and then like the. Uh, showcasing like the personality so we're going to continue to do like a lot of these post-race shows we'll do one again at Milrose maybe yeah. I don't know if you drink sick. out of the cup this time no I definitely not <laughs> I, I was crook again. after that that's the only time is that the only time I missed the podcast it is I think so that's the only time I missed it was when I was and I apparently El Pura was sick as well Pure was sick yeah, yeah, yeah. El Pure she was also sick because I think uh, Mark Coogan messaged Dathan's like did, did Ollie drink out of the cup? I was like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, he did. Yeah, he did. Yeah, he did. So, that, was, that was my boy. So we're going to lean into... I was going to say our class as well. I said that. Yeah, yeah. Old, oh, no. I forgot I about that. And Dathan's face. I knew I made a terrible mistake saying that. That was... So I think that opened a lot of doors for us. This year. That, <laughs> that, 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 that post-race show. Because then, like, we went into it not really thinking a whole lot. It was like, oh, this will be fun. We'll do a little post-game show out of... Uh, you know mm. Milrose games but then the proof of concept was there it's like we could do this at all these other meets mm. and then like we started getting hit up from brands it's like we gotta do like come do this at our meet and like there's we turned down multiple races that we like could have been at but um we'll do some of that i think you know there's obviously like we've streamed a couple meets we did the texas meet we did something in kansas city new york a couple times I, it, streaming is just like it's a whole nother animal we That's don't want to like get yeah. into like you know, fights with for rights for all these other meets. So I think what we're going to lean into is like, I think Kyle and I are really good at doing interviews with people as well as like David Melly, Dana Giordano, all the other podcasters that we've got within our network, Jasmine and Caitlin. And so coffee club, like we're going to just do a lot of interviews, uh, really get into, I don't know, like we, Mac is good at going out and like filming people and doing like a feature video on them. So can I just, can I just sorry, yeah. interact, interject is, because this is how I feel. Like, my biggest nostalgia about this sport is watching, like, old flow track workout videos. Is that what? Okay. Is that the same so, for you guys? Because that's isn't that, to me, that's the pinnacle of, like, so you enjoyment want, of the, the sport. The the easiest way is, like, you know, flow track has changed over the years. There's no, like, you when, when we were it, in college, yeah. like, it was different. Yeah. But, like, I was part of that tree for a bit under Ryan and Alex. And, like, I just don't feel like 
this generation of college kids really has those two types of people where it's like have, Sam Parsons tweeted like a photo it was like uh, it was like Alex and Ryan and then like the upgrade or uh, the meme yeah. and then it was uh, me and Kyle and I was like I really don't think like we're an upgrade but it's like for this generation of people they don't have like so it's us I think mm. in yeah. a way and we want to be kind of like the, those those personalities that are bringing you the commentary, the humor, and at the same time trying to make it easy. I think we're just hype guys for the sport in in the most positive ways. I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So yeah, I think we're gonna just gonna try and continue to do that across video, writing, social media, the Sidious Instagram. I feel like we want to try and continue to keep as a place that's like there's no sports center for like track, right? Mm, so it's yeah. like if you go there, you can see. The latest news or like who signed with what and occasionally get some highlights or f- results from from races and so make it easy to be a fan of the sport yeah it's cool i mean it's not necessarily easy to do but the the playbook is out there because the other sports are all doing it so it is out there sometimes i'm like <laughs> what we're doing is not really all that original it's like it's it out there it's be. just like like i'm a i've gone so far into like becoming an f1 fan and like i just now i'm taking like pieces of like i see that this works like in f1 how do i translate it to running so yeah yeah no continuing to evolve that's the that's the thing yeah well we are very excited to see how that goes for you guys and also just very thankful to have people like you in the sport because it makes our lives a lot easier in terms of following and enjoying the sport and participating in the sport as well Mm. uh so we're definitely huge fans of you guys, and hopefully at some point um, we get big enough to buy you guys. I still want to and put that out there. And then we can take all the credit and ownership of it. Yeah, yeah. Can't wait to do that. But <laughs> no, all jokes aside, thank you very much for coming on the show today. No, thank thanks you. for having me. This is this is great. Yeah, it was awesome. Um, thank you everyone for listening. We will see you next time.